Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. If you have ever been listening to a repeater and heard when two people are trying to access the repeater at the same time, you have heard intermodulation. One signal fighting or interfering with another and they modulate one another. In this case, the fundamental frequencies of the two signals are interfering with or intermodulating each other. Generally speaking, however, we do not speak of intermodulation in terms of the fundamental frequencies of the two signals interfering with each other. In this video, I want to address the whole issue of intermodulation. If you find this video helpful, please click on like and subscribe to the channel. So hang on as we dive in. In order for intermodulation to make sense, we need to understand some foundational facts. Because the whole topic of intermodulation is really not about the fundamental frequencies of two signals interfering with each other, you might wonder, well, what then is going on? To answer this, we have to go back to the foundations of where something other than the fundamental frequencies come from. This brings us to mixers. No, we're not going to be baking a cake. We're mixing two signals together. And just like in our kitchen, when we mix flour and eggs and sugar and the like together, we get something quite different out of the mix. Cookie dough! Yeah! Well, so also when we mix two signals together, we get something different out of the mix. When we talk about an audio mixer, we're talking about adding audio signal A to audio signal B and getting the resulting sum of these two. When we talk about mixing two RF signals together, we are talking about multiplication. So you're just going to have to pardon the math. We have to touch on the math just a little bit here. All you need to do is observe. So let's say we're talking about two sine wave signals. We can describe them mathematically in the time domain as signal one is equal to the amplitude of signal one times the sine of the frequency F1 times time, because this is in the time domain. Signal two is equal to the amplitude of signal two, the maximum amplitude, times the sine of the frequency, we have F2, times time. Now there is a mathematical entity that tells us that when we multiply two sine functions together, we get this. Sine of A times the sine of B is equal to one half times the cosine of the difference between A and B minus one half times the cosine of the sum of A and B. Notice these terms. We now have, when we multiply signal one and signal two together, we now have two more signals, one at the difference and one at the sum of the free two frequencies involved. But now we have these two signals rattling around in the mixer too, mixing with each other and with the input signals. In the end, we can expect not just the original two signals and the sum and the different signals coming out of this mixing device, but also the mixing products of these signals. Based on the above, I'll bet you you were thinking that a nice equation to describe what we can expect would be impossible. There's going to be all sorts of sines and cosines and gobbledygook to deal with, make your eyes glaze over. Uh, well, if we were trying to describe this in the time domain, yeah, it gets pretty intimidating. But if we decide to describe it in the frequency domain, it gets a lot easier. We have this potentially still somewhat intimidating somewhat compressed formula. We have the resulting frequency is equal to 
n, which is an integer, a number like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, a whole number, times the first frequency, plus or minus m, which is also a whole number like 1, 2, 3, 4, times the second frequency. Now, like I said, it's somewhat compressed because you have this plus or minus. But if we were to uncompress the formula for any given values of n and m, we would have three equations to solve. And those would be these. So we have the new frequency is this n times the first frequency plus m times the second frequency. That's one output of the mixer. Then we have n times the first frequency minus m times the second frequency. Sometimes this ends up giving you a negative number, so that's kind of an irrelevant, impossible thing. That's why we switch it around here and have m times f2 minus n times frequency 1. And if this one's negative, that's going to be positive. And if this one's positive, that one's going to be negative. That way you get the complete story. So let's do a quick example of exactly how this plays off. So let's say that we have two signals here. F1 is equal to 14.15 megahertz. F2 is equal to 14.175 megahertz. Now doing our math, we say, well, if N equals 1 and M equals 1, then we have one frequency is going to be 1 times 14.15 plus 1 times 14.175 and that gives us 28.325 megahertz. We have a second one, 1 times 14.15 minus 1 times 14.175 well, this gives us a negative result, so we ignore that one. Third one is 1 times 14.175 minus 1 times 14.15 gives us the result of 0 0.025 megahertz or 25 kilohertz. Okay, let's take the example here of n equals 1 and m equals 2. All right, so this turns to a 2, this turns to a 2, and this turns to a 2. Let's see what we get. Let's erase our results over here. So 1 times 14.5 plus 2 times 14.175 comes out 42.5 megahertz. This one is still going to be negative, so we ignore that one. 2 times 14.175 minus 1 times 14.15 comes out to 14.2 megahertz. That's right nearby. Hmm. Let's do one more. Suppose that n equals 2 and m equals 1. Okay, so here we have a 2, here we have a 2, here we have a 1, here we have a 1, here we have a 1. Okay. So 2 times 14.15 plus 1 times 14.175, we get a total of 42.475 megahertz. 
The second one is a little bit of a surprise, unusual for what we've been seeing so far. The second one is 14.125 megahertz. Again, potentially in band, potentially interfering with something because we're on the 20 meter band. And the last one, well, this one here now is negative, and so we can ignore that. So here's what the rest of them look like in the 20 meter band, the 14 megahertz band. If we were to go through the equations and calculate for various values of N and M with our two fundamental frequencies, 14.15 and 14.175 megahertz. And then just pick out the ones that fall within the 14 megahertz or 20 meter band. We would see that with N equal to 2 and M equal 1, we have one at 14.125. We already calculated that one. But notice this, when N is 3 and M is 2, we're at 14.1. When N is 4 and M is 3, we come out with 14.075. When N is 5 and M is 4, we come up with 14.05 megahertz. Notice, first of all, that these are one apart from one another in both the descending direction and ascending direction. Notice also that the difference between these two frequencies is 25 kilohertz. And notice also that the difference between each of these is 25 kilohertz. So what does that look like when we plot it all out so we can see the individual pips in frequency domain? So we have our fundamental frequencies here. We have N equals one and M equals two here at 14.2 and so on and so forth. Notice the decreasing magnitude of each one. That is because as these numbers go up, the N and M, the magnitude of the mix result goes down. Same thing in the other direction. Now that we've seen how that operates, how does this phenomenon apply to intermodulation? Well, going back to our example of the two signals, one at 14.15 megahertz and the other at 14.175 megahertz, mixing together, producing various mixing products. Let's just suppose that we're trying to listen to a signal that is on 14.2 megahertz with these mixing products present. One of the mixing products drops right on 14.2 megahertz. So we would have the desired 14.2 megahertz signal that we're trying to listen to. And we would have the undesirable 14.2 megahertz mixing product beating against it. The mixing product would be modulating the desired signal and making it potentially unreadable. This is why we carefully filter the incoming signals into our mixer and filter the outgoing signals from the mixer to avoid this sort of interference inside our receivers. This is also why they often pick such totally strange frequencies for the IF frequency in a receiver like the very standard 455 kilohertz. It is to avoid the effects of mixing products between the local oscillator, one of the inputs to the mixer, and the signals coming from the antenna, the other input to the mixer. Now, we don't always have this kind of control over our mixing environment, however. We would like to think that mixers only exist in our receivers where we can carefully add filters and choose frequencies to avoid this whole issue of intermodulation. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. Any nonlinear device can act as a mixer and produce mixing products that can interfere with communications. These could be a rusted bracket on a fence or a corroded connection between the sections of gutter on your house, a corroded connector or braid in a coaxial cable, or any one of a number of things. 
The corrosion or rust acts as a non-linear device, diode type action, mixing the two signals and generating new unwanted signals. The phenomenon is called passive intermodulation, or if you like acronyms, PIM or PIM, because all of these things are passively operating as a mixer. Now here's a case in point. There is a local repeater. Its antenna is located on a secure tower. Any climbing must always be done by professional tower climbers that have been sanctioned by the tower's owners. Totally understandable. There is also an AM radio station which transmits on 600 kilohertz some distance away. Well, somewhere in the vicinity of this repeater, either on the tower, the fencing, the guys, somewhere there is a corroded something that receives that 0.6 megahertz AM broadcast station and the output of the repeater and mixes them together. And one of the mixing products is right on the input frequency of the repeater. Fortunately, the mixing product is quite weak and does not seem to interfere with anyone using the repeater. However, if the repeater transmits a PL tone, this comes back in the weak mixing product and holds the repeater's squelch open with a lot of weak signal type noise as well. As a result of the restrictions of the site and the effects of this mixing product, the repeater cannot transmit a PL tone. Locating this sort of mixing product is a painstaking process using a directional antenna and a radio or a spectrum analyzer to try to discern exactly where the signal is coming from. Now, not all concerns with intermodulation has to do with repeaters and radio equipment and ham radio and all of that. Let's talk about the kind of example that can affect someone who isn't necessarily thinking about radio communication, but that's exactly what they're doing. We're talking about wireless microphones. Have you ever wondered why wireless mic manufacturers set frequency channels and groups of channels kind of in concrete in their products? Now, at first glance, we would think it is to make it easier to set everything up, and, and, and it does, actually. But that is not their primary reason. It is to avoid intermodulation issues when multiple wireless mics are being used. The signals from two mics together can produce no less than two additional frequencies nearby and potentially land on the transmit frequency of, say, a third wireless mic. The result is interference in the third mic signal. Its signal is being modulated by the mixing product. Now, to avoid this whole thing, companies like Shure and others do all of the hard math and set up groups and discrete frequency channels so that even if you use every channel, you will never have a problem with intermodulation. If you mix and match manufacturers in your wireless mic systems, I would not promise good results. So there you have it. The whole discussion of intermodulation can get very deep. I hope that I've provided enough information here so that you have a better understanding of what is what and why it is. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.